It's slow, but it's getting there. Hello, welcome everyone. My computer is very, very slow, but we are here together today. I'm very happy to welcome you to today's event from Explain the State of Your Pants. And we have a very super cool guest. So I'm very looking forward to uh, have him with us. Uh, George is going to be presenting an awesome talk about extreme weather. Uh, it's going to be really cool. So stay with us. We're going to have a short presentation by George and then we're going to play a game on Kahoot. So we're going to send you the link uh, so you can access the game with us. And then we're going to have time for questions. So if you're on YouTube, please enter them in the chat. On Classroom, that are with us today. I'm going to have a chance to talk um, or like share the questions with George directly. So I'm going to welcome George on the stage with me. Here you are. Welcome, George. Thank you, Alex. Merci beaucoup. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. My name is George Karunas, and I am a professional storm chaser and, uh, and explorer. And what I'm going to be talking about with, uh, with everyone today is some of my encounters with extreme weather. I specifically have a few different types of extreme weather that I want to talk about today. I want to uh, share with you a little bit about how some of those extreme weather events are changing due to climate change. And then I want to open it up to uh, to questions. So we're going to have lots of opportunity to uh, ask questions. And uh, I'm going to share with you some pretty dramatic photos. So I say we get rolling right in there, shall we? Looking forward to it. Let's go, George. Here we go. So if you want to play the show with us later, get ready for that as well. Like get your phone, tablet, or computer. Uh, and I'll send the info in the chat very shortly as well. Alex, can you see that screen? No. No. <laughs> it worked perfectly moments ago. I feel like it's my first day, and this is where the mess begins. You know, my computer crashed when oh, I played earlier. So no, no, no it's not you. Online, it's right? Percent me. I see exactly what I did wrong. It's all good now. Oh. Here you go. Yes. There um, we go. Right, that's working? It is. Perfect. Let's have fun. So, <laughs> yes, so I'm a professional explorer and I travel all over the world to document extreme forces of nature and natural disasters. Uh, I hold the title of Explorer in Residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. I am a fellow of the Explorers Club. Uh, I'm also a National Geographic Explorer. So I've done all kinds of stuff all over the world. I live in Toronto, in Canada. And uh, I got started about 25 years ago through an interest in photography and nature. And it just so happens that here in Toronto, we've got the CN Tower and it gets struck by lightning, sometimes up to about a hundred times a year. And so that was how I got my, my interest in severe weather because I would go and photograph the tower getting struck. And each lightning bolt is only about as thick as your finger, but it burns five times hotter than the surface of the sun, but for less than a second. And we're talking 100 million volts worth of electricity. So it's a, it's a really powerful force and I'm absolutely uh, you know, drawn to it. But, uh, but that's not where it ends. I also document volcanoes frequently repelling down inside active and erupting volcanoes. I've literally set my boots on fire on lava in places all over the world. I explore some of the world's most bizarre and extreme caves, including uh, this cave in Mexico that has the world's largest crystals. 
Uh, I do a lot of work with in, in polar regions, in Antarctica, in the Arctic. And uh, this is an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland. And I was planting a satellite tracking beacon on this iceberg to basically follow the path of this iceberg as it travels from Greenland down the coast of, uh, of Canada. And if you look really, really closely, you'll be able to see me. Let me zoom in, or not zoom in, but let me highlight. There I am right there, that little black speck on top of this iceberg that's the size of an apartment building. That's me. And you do not want to be on an iceberg when it rolls over. They're very unstable. It's a very dangerous thing. Uh, I've done this many times, but I cannot recommend it to anyone. Uh, because of all of the extreme things that I do, I attract a lot of attention from the media. So I frequently appear on television programs. I work a lot with the Weather Network. I had my own TV show called Angry Planet, and it aired all over the world. Um, we did 40 epi 49 episodes of that, uh, of that TV show. Um, you can see me on Netflix, on Science Channel, Smithsonian Channel, all over. You, you might, some of you might even recognize me. And because of all this uh, the documenting of extremes and weather and such, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to travel all over the world, about 80 different countries from Antarctica to Greenland, from Siberia in Russia to India, Madagascar, North Korea, Venezuela, New Zealand, all over. Okay, so today let's talk about some storms. So. This is a photograph from Texas, and behind me is this beautiful storm. It looks kind of like an alien ship that's coming into the atmosphere. It's got this just gigantic uh, rounded shape, and that's what we call a supercell storm. Um, most thunderstorms don't rotate, but this whole storm is spinning, and that's because you get you get the uh, different winds at different levels of the atmosphere that are traveling at different speeds and different directions, and that can cause these storms to spin. And when you have a storm that really spins, they can last for hours. They sometimes produce tornadoes, and we call those storms supercells. And here's sort of like a diagram of how a supercell looks. If you were to slice a storm in half and look at it from the side, this is sort of what it would look like. And the, the photograph here, is taken from, oh, down near the bottom right, where it says gust front. So that's where I am standing in relation to that storm. And you can see that there's that corkscrew effect. The, the storm itself is rotating. And if there is gonna be a tornado, not all supercell storms produce tornadoes, only about 10%. It'll be in that area, uh, sort of in the center of the storm where all of that rotation comes together. And this is huge. Like this storm can be twice the height of Mount Everest. You cannot fly an airplane over this storm. That's why uh, airline pilots have to fly around these storms because they're too tall. So it gives you an idea of how humongous these storms can be. They can produce flooding rains. They can produce hail to the size of baseballs or even larger. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen grapefruit sized hail. Of course, deadly lightning. Uh, is a, another effect of these storms. We've all seen uh, lightning and heard thunder. And they can sometimes produce tornadoes. Tornadoes are these violently rotating columns of air that uh, basically touch down. You've got all that rotation up in the cloud. When it sort of reaches down and touches the ground and makes contact and starts doing damage, then we have a tornado. Before it touches down, if it's only partway down from the cloud, from the storm, we call that a funnel cloud. Not every funnel cloud is a tornado, but every tornado has a funnel cloud associated with it. There are a few exceptions to that, of course. And some of them could be quite beautiful. These sort of rope or snake-like shapes reaching down from the clouds. And some of them are very brief, lasting only a few minutes. There are others, that last sometimes an hour and a half or more. This particular tornado was from Kansas and it was huge and it lasted 
about 90 minutes and it barely moved. It sat almost stationary in this farmer's field. And so what I do as a storm chaser is I try to predict where the storms are going to happen uh, through learning how to forecast the weather. I have to try and drive to get into position where those storms are going to form, sometimes hours before the storms even happen on a perfectly blue sky sunny day like today uh, i can predict whether or not there might be storms in the afternoon and so i've got to get into position before the storms happen and then if the storms do happen i have to try and put myself in a position where i can best view the storm and view a tornado if it produces one and do that safely without getting uh, blown off the road by high winds or encountering flooding from the rain or getting struck by lightning, things like that. So it's it's very difficult to be in the right place at the right time to view a tornado. And over my career, in about 25 years, I've, I've witnessed about, well, I stopped counting at 100 tornadoes. So lots of them for sure. Uh, this is another one from Kansas from a different storm. And you can see you've got this uh, funnel cloud that reaches down. And you can clearly tell that it's in contact with the ground. Notice how the funnel doesn't look like it reaches all the way to the ground, but we can see what looks like a bunch of debris being kicked up. And that debris tells me that that air has indeed made it to the ground and it's doing some damage. Whether it's just throwing dirt around, uh, which is the best case scenario, unfortunately, some of these tornadoes end up going into towns. And they do a lot of destruction when that happens. Um, sometimes they're quite photogenic. This is one from South Dakota. And I was working with a tornado chasing tour company at the time. So people would fly from all over the world. I would pick them up at the airport and we would basically travel for two weeks at a time, driving all around North America, trying to get into position where we could see these storms and particularly tornadoes. So when I took this photograph, I had a group of about maybe 10 or 12 people with us who were paying to come and watch these storms. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I did that for 12 years. Now, this one is very special. It probably doesn't look like much on your screen. It looks like a dark smudge. But if you look on the left side, you can see a little bit of light. And if you look on the right side, you can see a little bit of light. Everything in between, in the whole center of that frame, is nothing but tornado. And it is the largest tornado that has ever been seen by anyone. It has the Guinness World Record. This tornado has the largest tornado ever documented. And I was there for it. This is in El Reno, Oklahoma. And it was in 2013, 10 years ago. And it was so wide, let me think here, it was 4.3 kilometers wide. So to convert that, that's 2.6 miles across. So th that is unfathomably huge. Like this thing was just, just a monster. And uh, I was in a very good position. I was behind it. I knew it was moving away from me. So I was able to track it and stay behind it as it was moving away and uh, was able to stay on this tor tornado for quite some time. I didn't find out until several days later that it was the Guinness World Record largest tornado. And you can't tell how strong a tornado is just by looking at it. Sometimes a small tornado can be very strong and have very fast wind speeds. Sometimes a big tornado can be weak. And the only way to determine how strong a tornado is is by doing a survey after the fact and seeing how much damage was caused by the tornado. And uh, there are engineers out there that can look at a house, look at how the house was constructed, see how much damage was done to that house, and then they can tell you, oh, the wind speed was 220 kilometers an hour, plus or minus. And that's how they can sort of determine the strength of these tornadoes. It's almost impossible to measure the wind speed of a tornado as it's happening. There are a few ways, but it's very difficult to do. So where do tornadoes happen? Well, the vast majority, as a matter of fact, 75% of the world's tornadoes happen in the United States. Canada is second, but we're a distant second. The U.S. gets between 800 to 1,200 tornadoes every year. Canada gets about 100 or so, maybe a little more than that. 
And in the U.S., they typically happen in the central part of, uh, of, of the country. Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, those states. And it's there where all the perfect weather conditions come together. You have warm, humid, moist air that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico. You have drier air to the west in the desert in places like New Mexico and Arizona. You have high altitude winds, the jet stream as we call it, that uh, comes down, swoops in across North America. And where all those ingredients come together is right here in the middle of the continent. And so that is Tornado Alley. And that's where I spend weeks at a time chasing these storms, usually in May and June. That's the, the time when, the, when we see the most tornadoes. And so what about Canada? All right, well, Canada, we have two places where we get our tornadoes for the most part. We've got the prairies, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And that is sort of like, it's the northern extension of Tornado Alley. But then we also get quite a few in Ontario and southern Quebec. And uh, a lot of those happen because of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes have an influence on the weather in that part of Canada. And you can sometimes get uh, the sun heats the ground and the ground heats the air and that air wants to rise up. And cooler air from the lakes comes in and that can help trigger these, some of these uh, thunderstorms that can then go on to produce tornadoes. We call them lake breeze thunderstorms. So if you live anywhere near the Great Lakes area, if you live in Toronto or Buffalo or Chicago, any of those places, uh, the, the, the lakes have a tremendous influence on our weather. And we're gonna talk more about that later on because it's not just the summertime. So let's look at a little more detail about where these tornadoes are happening. We've got the classic tornado alley in the central part of the United States and extending up into Canada. But to the east of that, we still get a lot of tornadoes. It's not the most, but there's still a lot. And interestingly, because of climate change, we believe that over the past 40 years or so, we're seeing a trend in where more and more tornadoes are happening further east. So what this map is showing us is the blue area is where the most tornadoes happen. That's the classic tornado alley. But the, the reds and oranges are showing where the trend of these tornadoes, these, these strong tornadoes, are happening more frequently. So it looks like because of the way our climate is changing, we're seeing changes in that... Um, that high level winds, that jet stream that's happening very high in the altitude, in, in the in atmosphere. And that change is sort of pushing tornadoes further east a little more every year. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next 10 years or so. But there's a big problem with that. If you know much about uh, this part of the world, places from Texas up through Oklahoma, Kansas, up to Saskatchewan and, and Manitoba, there aren't a lot of cities. There's a lot of farmland there. So there's not a lot for these tornadoes to hit. But as you go further east in Canada, in the United States, look at this. All of those bright dots are cities. And so in the central part, um, unfortunately, this map doesn't show much of Canada. It shows a little bit there. But um, You've got quite a bit of darkness in the central part. And then the further east you go to the right, uh, you, there are more cities. More cities means more people. More people means more potential damage from these tornadoes as they're happening further and further east. So that has meteorologists and, and weather experts very concerned. We're watching, we're studying, we're trying to learn about uh, the relationship between Arctic sea ice, changing weather patterns, uh, currents of air, and tornadoes. So that's uh, it's one area of research that uh, is still very young, but we're trying to learn as much as we can. So remember I was talking about how the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, how those lakes affect thunderstorms and how they can produce quite a few thunderstorms in Eastern Canada, in Ontario and Quebec. Well, one other effect that they have is lake effect snow. And 
if you live in a place that has snow, <laughs> which I'm, I'm assuming most of you do, um, you're familiar with the with, with snowstorms. But lake effect snowstorms are something a little different. There are actually snowstorms that are caused by cold air passing over top of warm lake water. And by looking at this image here, this is a, a, a radar image that you might see on the Weather Network or, or somewhere else on television. You can see the five great lakes there. And just, just below or just to the right of these great lakes, you see these blotches of white and blue. And that's showing us where the snow is coming down. And I can look at this map and I can tell you that the winds are coming from from the northwest, from the top left of the screen, down towards the bottom right, towards the southeast. And as the warm air, oh, I've got an animation here. I forgot that this was animated. So there you can see the snow that's being created by the lakes. As the warm air, or sorry, pardon me, while the cold air passes over top of warm lake water, that air picks up moisture picks up humidity from that open water on the on the lakes. This will not happen if the lakes are frozen, only if the lakes are open. So in the early winter, you get a cold snap. You've got all of this uh, cold air going over top of the lakes, and you end up with lots and lots of snow, sometimes 20 centimeters, 50 centimeters. I've seen I've seen over 100 centimeters of snow coming down in a, in the span of two and a half days in some places that are downwind of the Great Lakes during these lake effect snow events. And of course it creates traffic chaos, uh, cities become impassable. Here in Toronto, we're kind of fortunate because we're north of Lake Ontario and the cold air hits us before it hits the lake. And so we're on the, the sort of the safe side of the lake and the people living on the other side in upstate New York they're the ones that get all the snow from Lake Ontario. We don't get it here in Toronto because we're sort of upstream, if you will. So what happens? We've got that cold air. It passes over top of that warm water. So imagine it's December, January. That lake has been heating up all summer. And then you get a cold snap. You've got a lot of uh, you know, cold air passing over that lake. That creates a lot of instability. That that warm air that's sitting right that's uh, right above the lake wants to rise up as that cold air passes over top creates clouds and then creates snow lots and lots of snow and here you can see a really great example of you got all these white streaks over top of the lakes and then those streaks continue on onto land so this is a beautiful example of how the lakes can affect our uh, our winter weather now interestingly as our atmosphere gets warmer, how is that going to affect lake effect snow? How does climate change affect lake effect snow? Well, if it gets warmer, then there's going to be less of it, right? Because you don't have that cold air going over top of the lakes. Well, at first you might think that that's right. But in reality, what happens is, or what can happen, is that if you've got really warm summers, those lakes absorb that heat during the summer and they stay warmer for longer into the fall into the winter and they don't get as much ice on them so you've got all of that potential energy stored in those lakes because of those warmer summers and then when wintertime rolls around and it does get cold you've got a lot more fuel for these lake effect snowstorms to happen so it's an interesting case where climate change might actually contribute to more snow in some areas, specifically here downstream of these Great Lakes. And I've got a couple of photos here from Christmas of just this past, just this past Christmas. This is on the, uh, the eastern edge of Lake Erie. And we had a really big lake effect snow event. Uh, it brought about two meters of snow to Buffalo, New York, and places nearby Fort Erie. And the winds were so strong, and this storm was so intense, that the winds were blowing across Lake Erie, whipped up the waves, the waves were crashing against the shore, and the spray from all of those waves crashing splashed up against these houses and instantly froze because it was so cold. 
So all of these houses along the shore of Lake Erie suddenly ended up completely encrusted in thousands and thousands of kilograms of ice. Like this was unbelievable to see. Like how do you get into your house <laughs> when it's covered in this much ice? Like how do the windows not get smashed? I'm surprised these houses didn't collapse entirely uh, just because they're so, there's so, so much ice on them. So this was a really extreme event. And as our atmosphere gets warmer and as we have more energy in the lake water being stored there because of uh, changing climate, we can expect to see more of these extreme events as well. And I wanna make sure we have lots of time for questions. So I've got one more thing I wanna talk about here. Um, and that is a recent storm that we had just the other day. This was on Friday, literally just the other day. And we had a snowstorm come through. This was not lake effect snow. This was just a regular snowstorm, but it was so powerful that uh, it dropped a lot of snow. Here in Toronto, where I live, we had about 30 centimeters of snow, so much so that the trees in front of my house started to bend over from the weight of all the snow. But what was more interesting is um, not just the amount of snow, this is the roof of my car, there was like 28 centimeters on top of the roof of my car, is that the snowstorm was accompanied by thunder and lightning, lots of it. Normally we don't think of lightning, thunder and lightning as something that happens in the winter time. But this storm was so intense that the snowstorm was very similar to a summer thunderstorm. It was very powerful and it actually produced about 220 lightning strikes across uh, Southern Ontario here where I live. And that's all, that's crazy. That's a lot. That's a lot. I've, I've seen, uh, we call it thunder snow. I've seen thunder snow a lot of times uh, over my lifetime, but I've never seen it like this. It's not a common phenomenon. It's quite rare. You see it in lake effect snow, but uh, this past week was the most I've ever seen here in the city of Toronto. And the way lightning works, it's really interesting. Imagine uh, dragging your feet across the carpet and then touching a doorknob. You get that little shock. That's the exact same thing that happens in a thunderstorm. But instead of your feet dragging across the carpet, creating that static electricity, you have crystals of ice high up in the clouds. And those crystals of ice, they rub against each other, blowing around in the wind. And it's just like rubbing your feet across a carpet or rubbing a balloon against your head and then touching it to the wall. That static electricity builds up and then eventually there's a spark. And that spark is huge and that's what creates lightning. And thunder is the sound of lightning. It's the sound of that, um, the explosive sound of that, uh, that bolt of that channel of lightning literally heating up the atmosphere so quickly. It's, it's basically a, a shock wave. And so we had a lot of that in this, in this uh, winter storm, very unusual. And so I set up a camera in my, uh, in my backyard and I've got a, a little video here to show you of the thunder snow. You won't see the bolt because there's too much snow obscuring it, but you'll see it and you'll hear the thunder. There's my backyard. There's the flash, wait for the sound. There it is. And it just kept going, just rumbling on and on. If any of you live in uh, Southern Ontario, I, I don't, don't, I'm not sure where the classes are uh, from, but I'm sure I'll find out in a moment. Uh, I'm sure many uh, maybe heard this. The other night. Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> the, stock, I, the thunder freaked out the dogs and uh, they didn't like it very much. They find it quite frightening. Um, oops, there we go. And so what I want to do is make sure that we have lots of uh, time for questions because I'm sure you have many and feel free you can ask me about 
uh, about anything weather related, tornadoes, hurricanes, snowstorms, lightning, hail, anything you want. It's all uh, it's all fair game. Sounds good. So thank you so much, George. It was so interesting, and I've learned a lot. I, I thought I knew a lot, but I've learned way more with you. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna play the game now. So if you guys wanna log in on the Kahoot, uh, I see a few joining, a few of you joining already. Uh, so you folks can go connect on the Kahoot uh, like website and use this code pin. And we'll start shortly as soon as I can find how to share my screen again. <laughs> but, and then we're gonna have time for questions. So you know you have time to like collect your thoughts a bit. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can put them in the chat. Uh, and uh, with the classes around us, we'll have them on the stage one by one ask questions. Um, Okay, so I see a bunch of you logging in on the Kahoot. That's okay. cool. Here it comes. You should be able to see that. And the questions are going to start shortly. So, um, okay. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. A lot of you are very keen today. That's oh, look at this. A lot of, lot of names logging in. Right? This is I great. Hope, uh, I hope they listened well to the presentation earlier to get the questions right, right? Well, we'll see. Okay, I'm trying to get, yes. The banner is gone. Uh, okay, we're gonna get started very, very shortly. It keeps it keeps moving now. Way too many people here for me to follow uh, what's going on, but uh, we're gonna start. We got 90, keep, holy cow, so many. This is great. Okay, I'm gonna start and people can still join as we go because uh, in terms of time, also we can ask questions later. So here we are, extreme, extreme weather. So still a few a few seconds to for you to join if needed. Okay, so first question: How oh, hot is a lightning bolt? Hot as the sun, twice as hot as the sun, five times older than the sun, or ten times older than the sun. Mm. So you have ten more seconds to answer. I know the answer. <laughs> I only <hope you> do. <laughs> Let's see if the others are gonna get it as well. So the answer, I want to give it, uh, George? Uh, twice as hot as the sun. That is pretty. So that is the, the blue, the blue answer. Okay, next one. Oh, sorry, wait a minute, wait, go back. Did I yeah. screw something yeah. up? Yeah. Uh, I screwed it up. And I go, I was gonna say, I think that the yellow one was the answer. Yeah, it's five times hotter. I'm, yeah, I, okay. They both have the same number of people answered. So that, uh, no. that screwed me up, yes. Yeah, I, I got two minutes like, to do that, but yeah. So One mistake. People run on the edge, but I think the right answer was five times. But That's right. twice, twice is already pretty warm, by the way. <laughs> I'm glad I caught myself there. That would have been embarrassing. Okay. Let's go with the second question. So, right or wrong? Lake defect snow only happens when the lake is completely frozen over. So, right or wrong? Oh, of course, you got it in French, though. So, you can practice your French at the same time. So. Write it on the left side of the blue, and wrong is the red one on the right. So the leg effect snow only happens when the leg is completely frozen, right or wrong? Um, most people said wrong, and they were right. <laughs> Correct. Yes, it only happens when there is open water on the lake. If yes. it's frozen over, then no leg effect snow. Cool. OK, let's see. So Radiant Duck is leading. Okay, so another right or wrong uh, question. Um, Tornado Ali appears to be moving east. Right or wrong? So right in blue and wrong in red. What do you think of the Tornado Ali? Is that moving east, like appearing to moving east or not? Alex, a quick comment. The photo that you have on here, I know exactly which tornado that is. I can tell you exactly when and where that tor where that picture was taken. <laughs> I love how you're looking there. The tornadoes. I love that. Campo, Colorado. I was there. It's a beautiful, beautiful tornado. <laughs> that is so cool. I feel like I want to have like you know more like dinner parties with you or whatever, and get more like those fun facts. So um, ninety-three got it right. Yeah, most people got it right. Kudos. Yes, Tornado Alley does okay. appear to be moving. Ooh, interesting. So fourth question. And Radiant Duck is still leading. Radiant Duck's on fire. Uh, who gets the most tornadoes each year? The US, uh, Canada, Lake Erie, or Australia? 
Who's the lucky one or unlucky one, depending on all you want to see it? <laughs> this one should be pretty easy. Let's see. So who gets the most tornado? Yes. Like most people got it. The US Lucky folks. <laughs> okay, so Red and Duck still ahead. Amazing Dove, close behind. Okay, so last question, right or wrong again? Thunder snow can happen in any storm, right or any wrong? Any snowstorm. Any snowstorm. That's something that I've never heard about until like 10 minutes ago, I have to say. Okay, so thunderstorm can happen in any snowstorm, right or wrong? And the answer was wrong, and most people did not get it. That's right. It only happens in the most intense snowstorms. It's a very rare phenomenon. Right, so you were lucky to witness that a few, uh, like very recently. Yes. Okay, that was fun. Uh, let's see. I think that probably Radiant Duck is still going to be ahead. We'll see. Uh, sturdy Deer and March Cheetah, and finally at the top of the podium, do we have the Radiant Duck? Ooh, amazing dough. Well, oh, upset. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you to you all to have um, like, join us for that. That was pretty fun. And now we're going to have time for questions with George. So I'm going to start with uh, the classroom that we have with us today. Here we go. Here's the first classroom. Hi. Hello. Thanks, Alexander. George, we did have some questions about the uh, thunder snowstorm, but you answered most of them. Thank you. We're uh, here in southern Ontario as well. What town? Uh, uh, we're in Georgetown, actually. Oh, nice. Georgetown yeah. gets a lot of uh, a lot of snow. We get a lot of snow. We have a lot of snow right now. Um, some of the students were wondering about your passion. Where did this all begin from? Uh, you know, I know you're talking about you're taking pictures a lot, but where did it all even further before that? But when I was a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and my heroes were guys like Jacques Cousteau. So I always had an interest in nature and science. And then as I got older, I was working in a completely different field. I was in engineering. And then I was taking my vacation time and I would uh, go and photograph storms. And I did my very first tornado chase in 1998. So I had a lot of interest even when I was a kid in science and nature, but it didn't really come out uh, until I was uh, in my mid to late 20s. Perfect. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we move to the other classrooms that we have. Let's see if they have questions for you, George. So, uh, Mrs. Evans, I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Go ahead. Right. Hey, we are a virtual class in Northeast Oregon. We take up over the whole Northeast County. And one of the questions we had was, what are the biggest challenges you face when you're storm chasing? Ooh, well, um, being in the right place at the right time. Mother Nature, is uh, she, she provides us with a lot of clues but uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to be wrong. So imagine trying to find a place in millions of square miles where you think one storm is gonna go up and maybe that one storm might produce a tornado. So being able to try and predict with enough accuracy to be literally at the right intersection uh, where, where that storm is gonna be uh, is very difficult. And then the storm moves sometimes at, uh, 20 to 60 miles an hour up to 100 kilometers an hour for those in Canada and so the storms don't uh, obey traffic rules they don't care about stop signs or traffic lights or speed limits and so trying to keep up and navigate and be in the right place at the right time is super difficult and that's why it's very rewarding when we're successful we miss most of the time yeah, that's a tough job. <laughs> uh, pretty dangerous one I, as well, I guess, by the way. Yeah. Even if you do get there, you're like, yeah, I've made it. But like, then like, watch out, right? It's like, it can, it can go wrong very quickly as well. All it takes is for, uh, you're going, you have to pass through a town and you're, you're slowed down because you have to go through a small town and the storm has gotten too far away and now you can't catch it. That happens all the time. Well, that's awesome. Okay, let's move on to the next classroom and see. Are you there? Hi. Yes, we're here. This is my team. You guys can say hi. Hi. Hello. 
And uh, Alexandra and George, we wanted to thank you so much. George, we're right here in Toronto with you. Yeah, and we brainstormed a whole bunch of questions before we met you today, but you answered most of them. But one that didn't come up with, what's your favorite type of weather? My favorite place? Favorite type of weather. Oh, my favorite, sorry. Type of weather. My favorite type of weather. Wow. Yeah. My favorite type of weather. Um, they're all different. I mean, I love, obviously, I love tornadoes and chasing tornadoes because they're very difficult. I like weird weather, like really unusual stuff, like the the thunder snow. There's there's one weather effect that I only caught once, which I was really excited to catch, and that was lightning in the in an erupting volcano. So combining two of my favorite things, lightning and volcanoes, together, um, I was in Indonesia at Mount Krakatau, which had a huge eruption in 1883, huge eruption. And uh, sometimes, remember I was talking about the the, the um, ice crystals rubbing together to create lightning? Well, in a volcano, you have an explosion and you have all the volcanic ash going up into the sky. Well, the little bits of ash can also rub together to create static electricity, which can create lightning. And I was able to capture that once in my lifetime. And uh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> You're getting picky now with your weather conditions. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Bye. Great. So Eastwood Collegiate, let's see if they have questions for us. Hey there. Hi, George. We're coming to you from Kitchener, Ontario, so not too far away. Not at all. Our question for you is, have you ever been stuck in a storm? Yes. <laughs> he says, smiley and all. Oh, let me count how many times. Well, I've been stuck in lots of different ways. Like, I've been stuck in the mud during storms, which can be uh, kind of frightening. Uh, a lot of the roads that we take are paved, but not, but not all of them. So when you get on a road that's um, made from clay, it sticks to the wheels and it's very easy to get stuck, especially if there's been a lot of rain. And I remember one time we were somewhere in Texas and we got stuck in the mud and there was a tornado very close to us. We couldn't see it because it was wrapped up in rain, but we knew it was there. And then suddenly golf ball hail starts coming down and we had nowhere to go because we were stuck in the mud. And yeah, that was a, it. Took us hours to get unstuck. That happens um, when I chase hurricanes. Basically, what I'll do if it's a strong storm like Hurricane Katrina was, I'll drive until I'm in the path of the hurricane, and then I'll find a place like a sturdy structure, like a parking garage, and I will sort of intentionally allow myself to get stuck there uh, and let the storm pass over me because I don't want to be driving around in it. So yes, I do get stuck in storms. Sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes it's not. Oh, I don't even want to know kind of like stories you must have. They must not all be that nice at one point. But well, thank you for the question. That was a very nice uh, segue into George's crazy stories. Let's see if uh, LCS, uh, is your mic working now? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Let's go. Hello. All right, so we're coming to you from Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yes. So we have uh, had tornadoes out here for sure. I'm not sure if any of the students have ever witnessed any, but we've certainly had tornadoes out there. Oh. The strongest tornado in Canadian history was in Eli, Manitoba, Hi. not too far from Winnipeg. That's right. That's right. Okay, so the, the kids have a question for you. They wanted to know, uh, has, have you ever been in uh, chasing a storm and where you miscalculated and all of a sudden the storm started chasing you? Mm. <laughs> no, that's never happened to me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That has happened. Um, usually I can look at a storm and I can tell you what direction it's moving, how fast it's moving, um, whether it's strengthening or weakening. And sometimes when you're getting very close, particularly close to a tornado, you can sometimes have these instances, especially towards the end of a tornado's lifespan. So a tornado will form, it touches down, it matures, it weakens, and then it dies. When a storm, when a tornado is weakening, it'll sometimes do a sharp turn to the left. 
And uh, if you don't anticipate that, <laughs> um, you can sometimes find yourself in the wrong place. And yes, there's been numerous times where I've had to scramble very quickly to get out of the path of a tornado. Yes. Okay, thank you. And it's something we don't like to do very, very often. That's when you know you've made a mistake when. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> well, let, me, let me just elaborate on that one little bit. We had an instance in Nebraska one time where a tornado touched down right beside us. And being from Manitoba, you're familiar with irrigation pivots, right? Those big um, pieces of farm equipment that they use to, to water the fields. Yeah. There was one beside the road with us and the tornado pushed that irrigation pivot right over and the end of it crashed into the windshield of the, of the van I was driving. Oh, wow. And uh, I was rolling video the whole time. So it's on YouTube. You can go look it up. Wow. We'll have to do that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And we have one, like our last class with us today. Let's see. Do you have a question for us as well? We do. We had a lot of questions brainstormed and a lot of them have been answered, but we have a little bit more specific question um, from another connected to another classes. Sure, hold on. To, where, where are you? We're coming to you from Calgary, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're just going to have a student read it. Go ahead. How do you keep yourself safe when you chase hurricanes and tornadoes? That's a good one. <laughs> awesome question. Awesome question. And there's a lot of ways that I keep myself safe. Number one, study and research. The more I know, the safer I can be because I understand how storms work. I understand when I look at the sky, I can tell you what's going on. Just like an airline pilot can sit in the cockpit of a plane, look at all the instruments and know what they all mean, right? So knowledge and experience help are the most important things, like study, knowledge, experience. Those are the things that keep me safe the most. But also, I travel with people that I trust. I look out for them, they look out for me. They know more than I do about certain things. I know more than they do about certain things. And we pool our talents together and work as a team. And I work with a lot of the same people for many, many years. But also, I've got a basement full of safety equipment as well. Helmets, dry suits, all kinds of gear that I use to protect myself in these situations. So it's a multi-level approach to safety. And I got to tell you, I'm very proud to say that over 25 years of doing this not a single broken bone not a single overnight stay in hospital that's amazing well thank you so much we've really enjoyed your presentation thank you awesome thank you very much so um in interest of time i'm gonna ask a few questions from the youtube uh channel because people had a lot of questions out there like you've answered a bunch as well that the classes have asked too uh but people are, are wondering uh, what happens if the lightning um, stuck um, on your house or in your cars? Like, ah, yeah. great question. So, obviously, a lightning bolt can kill you instantly if it hits you. So, where's the safest place to go during a thunderstorm when there's a lot of lightning? Well, outside is a dangerous place. And the worst is by a tree because lightning likes to hit tall objects so if lightning strikes a tree and you're standing beside the tree the electricity will pass through the tree it'll likely go through you so get inside get inside your house the safest place is in your house away from the windows your house will protect you from the lightning but your car is also a pretty safe place and most people think that your car is safe because of the rubber tires acting as an electrical insulator but that's not true at all what protects you in your car is the metal shell that the car is made out of. It's, it's metal, so it's a really good conductor. So if lightning hits your car, it travels through that metal around you. It's called a Faraday cage. And this cage of metal around you basically directs that electricity around you and safely down to the earth. So uh, if, you, if you can't... Uh, if you can't get into your, if you don't have a house or a building to go into, hide in a car. It's much safer than being outside in a Very store. good advice. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more question. Um, with the tornado alley shifting east, uh, have like builders, architects, and others starting to shift or they think about like building uh, new infrastructures and, you know, like refocus on, um, with like the new data that they have on the new knowledge that they have? 
Yeah, um, that's something that they're going to have to take into consideration at some point. But here's the thing. Even houses that live or are houses that are built in the traditional Tornado Alley areas, like Oklahoma, for example. Oklahoma gets more tornadoes than anywhere else. A lot of the construction standards are still pretty poor. And the reason for that is the odds of your house getting hit by a tornado are very slim. Very, very slim. There are people that live in Oklahoma their entire life and they've never seen a tornado uh, just because they're not at the right place at the right time, right? So it's hard to justify the increased cost for the low likelihood of your house getting hit. Where we're more likely to see an increase in um, building standards is in places that are affected by hurricanes more and more because hurricanes are so large compared to a tornado. Like the biggest tornado in the world was two and a half miles wide, 4.3 kilometers. Hurricane Katrina was, what was it? Like 600, 600 kilometers across or something like that. It was actually even bigger than that. So it was massive. So a lot more houses are affected by hurricanes than tornadoes. So in places like Florida, places like uh, North and South Carolina, those kind of places are really going to have to see increases in better uh, building practices for sure. And if they're listening right now, and they take your advice on it. Uh, I have two last quick questions. I don't know if we really have to leave, unfortunately. But one question is, what was your favorite place um, to travel when you chase extreme weather? My favorite place to travel chasing yeah. extreme weather. Wow. I'm looking at my giant map uh, uh, above, the, uh, above my office here. There's a lake in Venezuela called Lake Maracaibo. And it is the place in the world that gets more lightning than anywhere else in the world. And I went there years ago. There's a village out in the lake. There's no roads. You have to take a boat to get from house to house. It's literally on these stilts out in the lake. And you spend a few days there. And every night there's lightning around you. It's unbelievable. And it just, it's just a freak of geography that this particular place gets thunderstorms and lightning about 250 nights a year. Lake Maracaibo mm -hmm. in Venezuela. Hey, that's on my bucket list now, I guess. Uh, on what last question was, what happens if you get struck yourself by lightning? Ooh, yeah. well, that's one thing I never want to have happen. Um, the odds of you being killed or seriously injured are very high. You don't even have to be hit directly by a bolt of lightning to be killed by it. Lightning could hit near you. The electricity can travel through the ground, up one leg, across your heart, and then down the other leg. And you can, and that can cause you to have a heart attack and die. So um, I really <laughs> don't want to have that happen. And of course, I spend a lot of time outside in thunderstorms with a metal tripod trying to take photographs of these things. So I'm more likely to be struck than anyone else. And I've had a few close calls, but here's a safety tip. Here's a safety tip for you. If you're outside and there's thunder and lightning, obviously go indoors to be safe, especially if the hairs on, on your arm start to stand up or the back of your neck start to stand up, that's a signal that there's some electricity starting to build up around you. You've got some positive charge going up from the ground through you, and it wants to make an electrical connection with that negative charge that's coming down from the cloud. And as soon as they make connection, the circuit is complete and the lightning bolt will happen, hopefully not through you. So if you ever get that sensation, run as fast as you can, immediately go inside because you're in extreme imminent danger. Ooh, sounds good. Okay, actually, I have one last one, and this is really the big, the last for last one. Do you even do you ever um, do you always sorry? Yes, do you always get clear pictures of the storm? No, <laughs> no, I I often get terrible pictures of the storms because they're dark, and as you know, to take a photograph, you need light, and when you're in these storms. You've got water on the lens. It's dark out because the storm is overhead. Sometimes you're you're moving at high speeds. Uh, sometimes I'll be in the passenger seat trying to take photographs out the car window while we're driving at highway speed. So there's a lot of things working against me uh, to get clear photographs. So when I'm able to get good photographs, 
that's that's awesome and i and i've gotten better at it obviously over <laughs> two and a half decades but yeah it's very difficult to photograph storms very clearly uh, a lot of the time awesome well thank you so much george i think we're gonna have to leave it here because officially the time is up but there are so many other videos from you uh if people want to look it up on on youtube uh, you've done amazing work uh on like very cool photos throughout so people are free to go look it up Thank you so much for all the questions. People were very intrigued on myself too. And we got very cool questions from the different classes that joined. So thank you so much all. It was very cool to see you all. And thank you very much for joining. And thank you, George, so much. I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.